Okay, friends, I'm back and thank you for your uh, patience. And uh, let's get started with the second hour. We had just started some generic formulations, right? And uh, we wrote this. The first thing that you see over here is this thing. Okay, so dt dz is this function. Actually, what I should do is uh, at this point, let me write it down as qz, q double prime z, because this is generic. Okay. So note that tfm t wall q double prime h are all function of z. Okay, so now let us take each of them one by one. The first one let us take as start with isoflux. Okay, normally so far I was talking about isothermal before isoflux. In this case, I'm taking A as isoflux just because it is the simpler one. Isoflux case is simple because Q double prime Z is equal to Q double prime wall is equal to constant. Hmm? So what does it mean? This means DTFM dz is equal to q double prime wall times c divided by m dot ct which is also constant and well i i yeah okay this is constant and not a function of z but i remember that if c if, for example, if it's not a cross uniform cross section, but a reducing or converging diverging type of cross section, then this can be tricky. Actually, overall, the entire thing can be tricky because if it's especially if it's diverging, uh, the boundary layers again may detach from each other. So if those are complicated cases. We are not dealing with them. Okay. So what does this mean? Therefore, it means that T F M of Z actually TFI plus Q double prime C divided by M dot C P times Z. Okay. This actually we we have already seen this before. So this implies that the bulk mean sorry bulk mean fluid temperature increases linearly with that. Okay, so which means T wall of Z, also not, not which means, the other thing is T wall of Z will be Tf Z plus Q double prime over Hz. And since we know that for fully developed region, Hz is constant in fully developed the wall and the fluid temperature just follows each other they're just two parallel lines as we had drawn before okay case b isothermal okay so in this case what happens D T F M D Z is equal to C over M dot C P times uh, times H Z right from this expression basically. Oh yeah. From this expression. Except this T wall here is constant. We are going to use that. Hmm? 
So what we will write is let delta t is equal to Tw minus Tf. So this means d delta t is equal to minus dtf because tw is constant. Right? Okay. This is probably reminding you of something. Okay, let me ask you what. Where have we used this before? Okay. Anyway. Minus DTF. Minus C. Right? Basically, what I did is I replaced d t f m by minus d delta t in this equation. Okay. So now what you see there's a differential equation. So integrate integrate d of delta t by delta t equal to minus c over m dot cp and h z dz and let us say this is from zero this is l this is uh, sorry this is zero this is l and so this will be uh, delta t at the i at the inlet and delta t at exit okay so which means log delta T E over delta T I is equal to minus C L M dot C P times H bar. Okay, this is what I have used. H bar long L. Average heat transfer coefficient. Clear? So, or This I did from zero to L. If we integrated over Z less than L, I would have got TW minus TFZ TFI. Minus C X okay. What is the total heat transfer? That is our main 
the local heat transfer is also fine but total heat transfer is something that we are very interested in how much am i able m dot cp what can i write can i write it like this ew minus tfe minus No, I am sorry. Tw minus Tfi minus Tw minus Tfe. Correct? Does that gives you Tfe minus Tfi? Anna? So m dot Cp delta T I. Minus delta T exit. Achha. Also, Q conversion is H bar L average heat transfer coefficient times C times L, which is the area times some mean temperature difference. Okay. So this implies this mean temperature difference is delta T i divided by log of Okay, and this, my friends, we know. This is called log mean temperature difference. Because think about it, this is also like a heat exchanger, except that heat exchanger where the hot fluid temperature doesn't change. Maybe the hot fluid is condensing. Okay, exactly the same thing. So this is an appropriate temperature difference over the length of the tube. Okay. It is called LMTD log mean temperature difference. We know this, right? So therefore, if somebody asks you, okay, I have an isothermal wall. I have a fluid coming in at a isothermal, whatever. I have a tube with an isothermal wall. I have a fluid coming in at an inlet temperature of so-and-so. Mm -hmm at a certain velocity or a certain mass flow rate, okay? How much is going to be the total heat transfer? Okay, so you can calculate something like this. Okay, or they can tell you this is the mean temperature difference. So, I mean, you can, you can solve this problem exactly the way we solved heat, heat exchanger problem. All right, and now recall this difference uh, coming back to this plots. Over here, what is the temperature difference between wall and fluid? That is constant for isoflux. For isothermal, it is not. As you can see, the wall remains constant. The fluid temperature increases. So if I ask you, what would be the mean temperature difference over here? A delta T mean is going to be LMTD. Okay. Any questions? These are some very generic de derivations, but uh, this will help you, especially the isoflux condition will help you. So again, I'll, I'll give you just one minute. Go through these derivations. Okay, whatever I did. This is something very simple. But make sure you understand all of these. And you can relate these, uh, you know, the variations that I have, uh, or the expressions that I have, that we have derived, 
to the qualitative plots that we had drawn before. For an isoflux TW, the T fluid is linearly varying with Z and TW is T fluid plus a constant difference. That's exactly what we had plotted. For isothermal, it's a little more complicated. And it is kind of an exponential rise as we see here. <clears throat> All right, so with this, what I will do next is I'll move on to slides because the rest of it is primarily uh, about correlations. Okay, but any questions before that? Is everybody there? I hope I have not lost everybody. Everything clear? No questions? Okay, let's move on then. Okay. So this we had already discussed. There is a dis distinction between entrance and fully developed regions. This is the hydrodynamic entrance region, as you can see over here. And uh, you see that at the beginning, the core region remains constant over here, as you can see. This, this is the inviscid region. And then in fully developed, the flow doesn't change. But for, similarly, for thermal boundary layer, we saw that there's a thermal boundary layer that develops on the surface, that it increases. They have written it in this picture, it is written as X. In our notes, we have <coughs> denoted it as, as Z. So I have made a mistake. You guys should have pointed it out. I'm sorry. How do I end this? End the show here. Sorry. So if you look here, I think somewhere I, I made a move. Why did I write X here? This should be Z. Okay, all right. So that was a small correction. Let's now move to. Slides once more. So, what you see is there is a thermal boundary that develops on the surface of the tube, which we have already studied. And <clears throat> these are thermal and thermo thermally fully developed flow. Derivations, laminar flow through a circular tube, I'll, I'll post, and I've already done some of these. And uh, now coming to the correlations. As I said qualitatively, and it is also possible to derive, uh, at least for analytically, at least for isoflux, that the Nusselt number and therefore heat transfer coefficient for fully developed flow is constant. For flow through a tube, Please keep this in mind. Okay. For flow through a tube, the Nusselt number for fully developed flow, keep that in mind again, for fully developed flow is constant. Okay.
that value is 4.36 for isoflux, 3.66 for isothermal. Okay. 4.36 for isoflux, 3.66 for isothermal. Heat transfer coefficient is constant, which is what we had drawn also. That, that blue line that I had drawn before, now you relate from here. Why did I draw it to be constant? Because Nusselt number is constant, and for a given yeah. diameter and fluid, where the thermal conductivity is constant, which means the heat transfer coefficient also attains the constant value when the flow becomes fully developed. Clear? All right. So this is for laminar flow. When you get to turbulent flow, and again here, remember, unlike flat plate, this is not laminar followed by turbulent. This is either laminar throughout or turbulent throughout, depending on the diameter, flow velocity, and fluid properties. You calculate Reynolds number. If it is less than 2,000, it is laminar. If it is greater than 2,000, it is turbulent. Okay, I said this is wrong. I don't know. This is wrong. This you can use pretty much for greater than 2000. There's something called Dieter's Bolter correlation, which says that Nusselt number is 0 0.023, Reynolds to the power 0 0.8, and Prandtl to the power n, where n is typically one third. Okay, this we use very often. What they say is n is 0.3 if the if the if it's a cold surface and 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 it's a you know cold wall and hot fluid flowing through. Basically, there is heat transfer into the wall, or it's n is equal to 0.4 when it is heat transfer from the wall to the fluid. But you know, to be to be honest, we all use one third and more or less okay. Okay, but this is correlation. We should look at. If the wall is rough and you want to take the roughness uh, parameters into consideration, then there is something called Nilinsky correlation, where it also gives you the Nusselt number as a function of the friction coefficient. Okay, and again, friction coefficient, how do you get it? Is from our old friend Mudicha. Clear? Yeah. So again, these correlations I, I repeat, I keep repeating, these are your, your friends. Okay. You have a bunch of them with you and you use it as and when required. Okay. All right. So this is what I was talking about, smooth surface. Achha. Now the next thing is, what happens if it's a non-circular tube? It's the same thing. You use the hydraulic diameter, four times cross-sectional area over the wetted perimeter. Okay. Now, you have to keep a few things in mind. If you consider, let us say, a rectangular cross section like this. This is your tube. The flow is happening into the tube. Okay. So there will be a boundary layer that forms on the bottom surface, on the side wall, on the top surface. So at these corners, what happens is they kind of interfere right from the beginning. Okay, unlike a tube where it is axis symmetric, this is not axis symmetric, right? Now, what we do is, therefore, for 
even though there are some going to be some uh, differences but what we typically do is we use this the basic correlation okay for laminar flow and turbulent flow for a circular tube or a tube of a circular cross section but instead of the diameter we now use the hydraulic diameter okay so for turbulent flow the ditas volter or nilinsky correlation can be used okay for laminar flow also you can use it but what happens is the nusselt number is a function of aspect ratio okay what do i mean by that okay so let me draw i have something written in my notes just let me turn those to that page ah yeah so what i will do now is i will give you i'll, I'll again start I move over to one note. I think I'll duplicate this. Thing. Okay, so this is fine. All right. Now, so you have to make some notes in your notebook because I am kind of. alternating between slides and handwritten notes so make sure that you understand which one to refer when okay so non circular tubes you can take it down this is available in many uh In most textbooks, but I'll just write it. B over A, cross section B by A. This is Nusselt T for isothermal, isoflux, and this is F times. dh so this is dh okay so this is h okay so the first thing which we have we were doing first is a circular cross section is nothing called b by a and this we know isoflux is 4.36 isothermal is 3.66 and f is 64 by reynolds number okay next we come to a square cross section where a equals to b this is one isothermal here actually is 2.98 so please i have seen many people don't take into account this cross sectional variation it it can lead to a lot of difference you see 3.66 to 2.98 it is more than a 20% difference 22% difference it will be off in your estimations by significant amount okay similarly 3.61 okay and friction coefficient is 57 all right So B by A here is two. For two, this is four point one two. This is three point three nine. This is sixty two. Four.
If it is four, see there are intermediate values. There are values for three, values for six, eight, blah blah blah. Things. So I'm giving you some ideas. If it is four, uh, this is five point three three. And this is four point four four. So the heat transfers are higher, okay, because there is boundary layer interference. Uh, you know, this boundary layer grows first. This boundary layer, uh, I mean, the boundary layer along A, or basically normal to B, they interfere first, and A interferes later. Uh, okay, all right. So five point three three, and then let me see how four point four four. That is fine. And uh, this is for four. Now this is seventy three. Okay. And then finally, let us say this is like a micro channel. Okay, this one dimension is very small, the other is very low. Compare. Okay, so it's we are writing it as infinity. Ah, so this becomes actually this is quite this is seven point five four. Okay, so for micro channels, why micro channels is uh, something that many people have focused on is heat transfer coefficients are high, but pressure drop is also high. For a circular channel, 64, remember, this is 96. So if the friction coefficient itself is 1.5 times higher, then your uh, overall pressure drop will also be higher. Then something which is often encountered is it's not fully isothermal or isoflux. It is heated on one side and insulated. Okay, so this is insulated and this is heated. Rest is the same. This is infinity. So slightly different. This is uh, eight point three three becomes five point three nine. Definitely because heat transfer will be affected. It is not there is no thermal boundary layer occurring on the insulated surface. Flow doesn't matter. Flow remains ninety six. Okay. And finally, let us say an equilateral triangle. Even though I have my drawing is not great. There is no question of B by A. Okay. Two point four seven. 3.1153. Okay. Achha. One more slide I had, yeah, over here. The next is the concentric tube, the annulus, right? There is a internal cylinder and an external tube. So in such a case, what happens is the flow is happening in the annulus. So how do you calculate? How do you calculate what is going to be <clears throat> my hydraulic diameter? What will be the nacelle number, et cetera, et cetera? Okay. So convection coefficients in this case are associated with both the surfaces. The internal surface, which we are calling I, and the outer surface, which we are calling O. So QI double prime is going to be HI times the temperature difference from the inner surface, and QO double prime is going to depend on the heat transfer coefficient of the outer surface. Okay. So there are lookup tables actually to find these values. Okay? And if, if it is required, they'll be given to you. But one thing, keep in mind, the hydraulic diameter, highlight the pen. Look at this thing, hydraulic diameter. dH minus di, where does it come from? You can probably work it out. BH is four times 
the cross sectional area what is cross sectional area 4 times pi by 4 divided by sorry d not square minus di square and what is the weighted perimeter that is 2 uh, sorry not 2 pi d not plus pi pi so as you can see the pi pi cancels out and you have d naught by minus di which is left okay so nusselt number depends on this this ratio di by d naught or d naught by di and surface thermal conditions so standard tables are available so don't worry about those okay for fully developed turbulent flow you can use the correlations for like ditas bolter or nilinsky and replace d by dh okay acha this is where we had stopped earlier now one more thing this is very important is the effect of the entry length remember what happens in the entry length and we we through some qualitative trends, the heat transfer coefficient comes down from our understanding. Okay, the temperature difference is zero at the leading edge, then it will and then it will increase. So all that stuff. Okay, but this is important to study systematically. It is important to know that in the entrance region, in the entrance region, how do I calculate Nusselt number? That is important because that is where heat transfer is highest. It will be stupid of me to neglect that, right? Especially for short tubes. Right? You know, when if you look into your, I, I keep giving this example. Your laptop does have a an outlet vent. You put your hand, you can feel the hot air coming out. If you just look through the vent, you will be able to see these parallel fins. Either they will be color of orange color because it's copper. Sometimes this copper is also coated with some, some coating, so it will give you a steel type of finish. But you can see those fins. Okay. So if I have to calculate, you know, the spacing between two parallel fins probably would be 5 mm, 3 mm maybe, 2 to 3 mm. And the length would be 10 mm, at best 15, not more than half an inch typically. That's why I said 15 at best, but maybe 10 mm to be to get a round figure. If you calculate the developing length, you will see that it is quite a bit. Okay, because my flow length is just 10, 10, 15, 10 mm or 15 mm. If I now say that instead of developing region, I'm going to assume fully developed. Oh, that's a little bit stupid of me. I'll be uh, underestimating my heat transfer by so by a large extent. Not only that, I am also going to be underestimating by pressure drop. Right? Because the flow is developing, my skin friction coefficient is going to be higher. If I neglect that, and just go to Moody chart for full data flow, that's that's going to be stupidity. Okay. So what I'm trying to tell you again with this practical example is there are situations and lots of situations where you cannot neglect, where it will be stupid to neglect the effect of the entrance region. Okay. So this one, what you look here, this this plot, what you can see on this slide, gives you the Nusselt number variation along the flow length. Okay. So the Nusselt number is our known expression HD by K. Remember this, the X, the X coordinate is a non-dimensional length. Okay. That is known as the Graz number, GR. What did it do? 
he said is z by d divided by reynolds time prandtl and i don't know for some reason instead of instead of telling this as the grais number he took the reverse as the grais number so z by reynolds number time prandtl number divided by z by d is the grais number so what is plotted over here in the x direction is actually sorry he said here is grass off i'm sorry gz is 1 over gz okay so what do we see we see that typically when the 1 over grass number is about 0.05 Maybe point zero seven or so, a Gratz number therefore is maybe fifteen to twenty. That is when the flow becomes fully developed. Okay, the fully developed flow, Nusselt numbers we know is four point three six for isoflux. And three point six for. isothermal but before that as you can see nusselt number is much higher it is like 20 this is for air by the way prandtl number air it is like 20 at 1 over grass number of 0.001 okay so therefore you have to first find out for any problem that if the tube length is let us say you are, you are giving it the 10 10 cm tube let us say so you calculate what is grass number if grass number corresponds to let's say in out of 20 mm it only corresponds to 2 mm then you say maybe i can neglect it but if it becomes like 10 10 mm is uh, the developing length from this grass number equal to 0.05 0.07 or one over grass number equal to 0.05 or 0.07 in that case you cannot neglect the entry length effects okay and then you can find out what is the nusselt number and therefore what is the average heat transfer coefficient in the developing region after fully developed after fully developed flow we know this correlation clear so once again it is important to consider and have this judgment of when i can neglect entrance effects and when i cannot okay now you see two uh, the last point i want to make is in this plot and i'm going to share the slide set with you what you see is there are two sets of or two pairs of lines one is the solid the other is dotted okay of course one corresponds to constant heat flux one corresponds to constant heat transfer in both these pairs now what is the dotted line b it means it is the thermal entry length so you may ask what does that mean combined entry length and thermal entry length combined entry length is when the tube is heated throughout and thermal entry length is when the flow is already fully developed but now you have started heating recall like that unheated starting length or unheated length for flat plate this is similar thermal entry length corresponds to when you have this tube okay the flow is already fully developed but then you start heating over here that is my thermal entry length combined entry length is when both the hydrodynamic and thermal boundary layers are developing together 
All right. I again repeat, thermal entry length means that the hydrodynamically the velocity profile is already fully developed, and then you start heating. So typically, it's like a long pipe, and only one section after a certain downstream distance is heated. Okay. Whereas the combined entry like this means that the flow is entering the pipe, and right from the beginning, the pipe is heated, either at a next constant temperature or or at constant heat flux. All right. So thermal entry length, however, what I wrote in the last one is, think about it, when the Prandtl number is much, much greater than one, okay. then what happens? The momentum boundary layer is much thicker compared to the thermal boundary layer, right? So this is also an approximation that you know the flow becomes fully developed very soon. The momentum boundary layer is so thick, it, it grows at a very fast rate, and then you know the two the two boundary layers interfere on both ends and the flow becomes fully developed. Okay, so an uniform inlet velocity profile is also an approximation where Prandtl number tends to let's say very high number, like infinity. Like oil and so on. So these are some correlations for combined entry length, average nacelle number, etc. But uh, it's okay. Again, for thermal entry length is three point six six plus. Some of these correction factors because a set number is higher at the entry length. Okay. So again, some correlations, these are again in your toolkit. You will use it as and when required. For turbulent flow, turbulent flow, the entry lengths are typically less and can be neglected. Okay. And especially for long tubes where L by D is greater than 60, you can completely neglect uh, the entrance effect. Okay. For short tubes, we sometimes do a correction factor C1 plus C by L by D. And these are some of the yeah, this is I mean this is a correction factor. So for non-circular tubes, laminar flow, we just uh, refer to the table. But for turbulent flow, you can completely use the correlation for a circular tube, replacing D with the hydraulic diameter. OK. A few final notes that when you are determining Nusselt number in terms of Reynolds number or Prandtl number or even thermal conductivity, what temperature will you consider these properties? And that what they say is the mean film temperature. Uh, or a good approximation is what is that? Because the fluid temperature is continuously changing. So one of the ways is you take T, T inlet plus T outlet by T. Okay. Right, I'm talking to a problem solved in class, which I'm going to do next. I don't know if we have time today. I, the clock i think i don't think we have time today so in the next class which is tomorrow what we will do is yeah yeah let me stop sharing no this is a bit involved this is a bit a lot of information but tomorrow what we will do is we will start by solving a problem okay and today, sometime, I'm going to share with you a list of correlations, a correlation you know, reference sheet, let us say, and, uh, and these slides, et cetera, so that you have them with you. And 
again convection is the more number of problems you solve different types of problems because it's correlation based it's just practice so we will start with a problem tomorrow and uh, yeah i think that's about it and then we will we can move on to natural convection okay 957 uh, let me st stop recording now and any questions Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. And as, as usual for your questions, I'm going to stay on for another three to five minutes.